Well, hello, Hope family. We begin the Christmas season. I'm so glad to see you. I love you. I'm glad you are here today. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and you've awakened from your food coma by now and are here today. And we're ready to celebrate the beginning of a brand new series that's called A Season of Wonder. You know, this idea of wonder is a New Testament idea, and I want you to, to take a journey with me today as we begin to take a look at some of the people that are the familiar characters of this narrative in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to talk today about Mary. We'll talk next week about Elizabeth and then Zachariah. We'll talk about the shepherds, of course. We're going to talk about Jesus in every one of the messages. And on the Sunday after Christmas, we're going to talk about the Magi who visited the Christ child and how that changed their lives. And so what we're going to experience as a common theme in every one of these encounters is a sense of wonder. Now, it's hard for us as 21st century Americans because we know the narrative well. We can recite it, we can tell it, we can share it, and we sometimes lose the sense of wonder. So let me just give you a working definition of the word wonder, how it might inspire your own story in this season. Wonder is a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. Now, the idea is that during this series, as we go through the Word together, that something will happen in your life that is previously unknown. It's un unanticipated. It's, it's a surprise. It's a, a sense of wonder that God has actually worked in your heart in the midst of a really busy season to bring you to a new sense of closeness to the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we go through this journey, I want to ask you to open your hearts to the wondrous journey that God has for us. Now maybe, maybe, just maybe, you've come here today and you say, wow, pastor is laying just one more thing on my already packed schedule. You know, when we talk about plans and purposes, you say, Pastor, I have a lot of plans already during this season. My head's already swimming with the plans. And maybe you're experiencing a mixture of emotions. They might be excited, joyful, hopeful, the coming of people that are loved ones to visit with you. Or maybe you're dreading or resisting this season. Maybe you're like some Americans who just wish that you could fast forward right beyond the Christmas season and get to January 1st and get on with your life. I don't know where you're at spiritually or where you're at emotionally. Maybe you're grieving. Maybe you're longing for something that never was or that you hope could someday be. Maybe you're stressed out or exhausted. All I know is... I want you to experience a sense of wonder during this season, spiritually. We're coming against all of these things swimming around us, and I'm saying, walk with me through the Scripture during this wonderful month of December, and I believe that if you stick with me, God is going to do something in your heart and in your soul that will give you a sense of wonder. I don't want it to feel like just another expectation put upon your already laden heart. What I want you is to look beyond that sense of experience the magic of the season, some Walt Disney kind of voice. I can't do that. But what I really want you to do is experience the presence of Jesus, that Jesus is near, and that when you hear the word Emmanuel, which means God with us, that you will begin to reflect on all of the ways that he literally is with you. We're going to celebrate the coming of the Savior, Jesus, who changed the world, but also changed our lives. Because where would we be today if it were not for Jesus? 
You know, I think back on a letter that I wrote to my parents when I was in my early 20s, and I, I just had come to the realization, you know, at some point you kind of have to grow up. Now, don't talk to Renee because she thinks I still have a long ways to go, especially when I'm with my grandsons, you know. But I kind of grew up enough to recognize what the heritage my family gave me to lead me as a youngster to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I wrote them this letter. My mom, I'm sure, has it. She keeps everything I ever sent to her. But I wrote to them a heartfelt letter saying, I wonder where I would be today if it had not been for you and for your leading me to know Jesus, even as a youngster. Where would I be? Would I be AWOL? Would I be in prison? Would I be lost? Would I be an addict? Would I, where would I be? And some of you are looking at me and you're saying, I know. Because I had to find my way down a long, broken road before I found Jesus and I found new life and a direction for my life. You see, that's a sense of wonder, that Jesus changes our lives. So today, we're going to start with Mary. After coming of our Savior to earth, began with Mary. Think about her for a moment. A young woman hardly a woman. Some scholars say maybe as young as 14, some say 15 or 16, but she was for sure a teenager. And she, as we'll read in our text, opened her life, her soul, and even her body to God's plans. And that's why today's message is titled, Open Your Heart to God's Plan." Open your heart to God's plans. So let's read our text together from the beautiful text of Luke chapter 2. I'm going to start reading at verse 26, and the words are on the screen in the English Standard Version today. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named, whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Pray with me for a second. Dear God, we ask that as we have read this word together, that you will anoint this message. Not only anoint the one who brings the message, but anoint every hearer that we can hear your voice as you speak to us through this message today, even as you have spoken to your servants throughout the ages, we pray it in Jesus' name, and we, together we say, amen. There are four great lessons for us out of this text today, and the first lesson is this. God has a purpose for your life far beyond what you can imagine. Now, he really does. 
This isn't just some sermonic point here. The scripture text teaches us an important principle when we look at the life of this innocent young woman by the name of Mary. That God has a purpose for her life that was far beyond what she could ever imagine. You see, Mary, I'm sure, never dreamed that this would be the story of her life. If you had asked six-year-old Mary, what do you want to be when you grow up? I doubt that she would have said, I would like to be the mother of the Messiah. I doubt that very much. She had no idea that God's plan and purpose for her was so big. But the point is transferable to us. We're not all called to be parents of the Messiah. But what I'm saying to you is that God has a plan and a purpose for you and you have a place in human history that, ha that makes a difference. I've heard stories about little children who were spoken to by older adults in their young youth. This literally happened. One of the most well-known Protestant ministers of our age told the story of how when he was four years old, his uncle came to visit and he ran out to the gate on their farm and swung open the gate and his uncle tousled his hair and said to him, God has a great purpose for you. And he said, you know, that stuck with me throughout all of my life. And he became one of the most well-known ministers in the 20th century. You see, God has a purpose for everyone's life. God has a vision that's bigger than ours. What do you want to be? God has something in store for you that is far greater than you can imagine. Look at what verse, what verse 30 says in our text. Do not be afraid, Mary. It's underlined here. Now, that's the first thing that kind of causes us to stop. Just have to get into the drama of the moment. Here is this young woman in her bedchamber, and suddenly this bright angelic being shows up Says, saying, do not be afraid. She's probably shrieking and pulling the covers up around her, her chin, right? She's scared spitless. Again and again, you hear the word of the Lord saying, do not be afraid. A word of reassurance. And that's a word for every one of us is that God has plans for you that you may not want to accept because you're afraid, because you live in fear. And the angel says, do not live in fear for you have found favor with God. She was pure, she was innocent, and she was open to the plans of God. Are you open to the plans of God? And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. When I say that God had plans for her far bigger than she could ever imagine, that's just an understatement. But you know, there are things that God wants to do through you the question is, how are we going to respond? When the unknown, unknown looms large ahead of us, we have to choose between fear and wonder. I'm sure Mary had lots of questions. We see some of them right here in our text. How can this be, she said. We can only imagine all that she was trying to process in that moment. And like Mary, this is the second great truth of this text today, like Mary we tend to focus on all of the logistical questions instead of focusing on God's purpose. How is this going to happen, she asked the angel. Explain it to me. You know, when God asks something of us, we start trying to sort out how it's going to fit into our lives. We start looking at all of the impossibilities. It's, it's easy for us to focus on all of the logistical impossibilities. You know, Renee and I went through that as young married couple when we felt that the Lord was leading us to go to a little western town in Wyoming. You know, Wyoming, by the way, is snowed in right now. I just saw something of some friends of mine in Casper, Wyoming. They said all of the roads uh, coming out of Casper are closed. And then it said, translated, Wyoming's here it this way. I dare you, go for it. You know, right? That's how they live out there. It's like, you're not closing me in. But anyhow, we went to a little western town in 
Sheridan, Wyoming, to plant a church. Now, when we arrived in Sheridan, we didn't know a soul. We had three little kids all under the age of four. A baby who was three months old. Renee often joked, you planted the church, I raised children. <laughs> you know, that, that took all of her energy is to keep the kids uh, going. But I'm saying to you, you know, we, we had a ministry where we were in Seattle. We had to sell our home, and we, had, we, we were trying to sell our home. We had lots of logistical impossibilities. We had nowhere to live. We, had, we, had, we didn't know anybody. We, we were just answering the call of God. We began to think about a long list of logistical problems, and we, we looked past them, and we did it. And the Lord used us, and we led a lot of people to Christ, and we baptized a lot of people, and we planted a great church there. But I want to say that I think that one of the reasons we get so focused on all the logistical impossibilities is because we're afraid. We live in fear. Those moments leave us disoriented. We're looking for control. We want to control our lives, but fear takes hold, and we want to hold on tight. Mary, no doubt, was afraid. When the angel arrived, she was afraid, and the text says this. So she was faced with a powerful choice of wonder over fear. Verse 34 says, how will this be, since I am a virgin? She was constantly trying to settle in her mind these impossibilities. You know, the enemy uses a lot of methods to frustrate our faith. We look at the logistical problems. We focus on people instead of focusing on God. We're thinking about other people's opinions. What are they going to think about the choice that we made? Or we're even thinking about the other people who have let us down. And we're so focused on the people who have disappointed us and let us down that we can't even accept what God's called us to do. But choosing wonder means that we're living now in a state of curiosity, saying, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I believe the Lord will help me. Here's some affirmations that we would say that everyone can be backed up with Scripture. I know that I can trust you, God. I know that you are going to work for good. I know that you'll never leave me or forsake me. I know that I can see you in the midst of this challenge. And I know that you are with me. Let me repeat those affirmations again. I know that I can trust you. I know you're going to work for good. I know you'll never leave me or forsake me. I can see you in the midst of this challenge. And you are with me. Wonder is living in the reality of Emmanuel Jesus is with me. This is hard work, choosing our perspective over and over again, choosing not to live in fear. Fear can control us and it can limit us. In fact, I want you to take a look at this little graph that I've created where we see the difference between fear and wonder. This is where fear and wonder is contrasted. You see that the greater is fear, the less there is wonder. And the greater is wonder, the less there is fear. You see, fear and wonder cannot really coexist. When one increases, the other decreases. And maybe you can add this to it, and you can say, when we begin just thinking logically, you begin to see that's where fear is heightened. And when we begin thinking theologically, that's when wonder is heightened. You see, many years ago, I heard a challenging message. We had a, a minister who came to our church when I was pastoring in St. Joe, and he was from Rome, Italy. He had been a great evangelist, and he had led a lot of people to the Lord in his life. And the title of his sermon, I'll never forget, I still have the cassette tape. Do you youth know what a cassette tape is? Never mind. So here's the cassette tape title. It's right on there. It says, Are You Thinking Logically or Theologically? See, when you think logically, the limitation is in your own head. It's right here. Put your fingers out there and measure that. It's about six inches. Okay, so you have a six-inch gap there. But when you think theologically, your mind is open to the world. You're understanding that God can do anything. 
the scripture says in Isaiah 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sometimes I hear people say, I just want to know the mind of God. And I want to say, do you know that if I knew the mind of God, that would be like plugging a two-cell flashlight battery into Hoover Dam. It would just blow my mind apart because we can't know the mind of God. We can't contain the mind of God. My thoughts are not your thoughts, God says. That means you can never say, my thoughts are God's thoughts. We, we can try to get in alignment with God's thoughts, Neither are my ways your ways, because God never does it my way. Does he do it your way? We need to be reminded, and this is the third great truth out of this text, God can do anything. That's what the text says. When the angel reassured Mary that nothing was impossible with God, you see, Mary had focused on the logistics. She didn't say, tell me more about the kingdom which will never end. Tell me more about the one who will sit on the throne of his father, David. Tell me more about this great kingdom. No, she wanted to know, how does this apply to my life? How can it happen? I'm a virgin. I've never known a man. How can I be a parent? And the angel explained it to her. And she didn't say, oh, now I get it. She didn't say that. You see, that's when we know that we can never really understand God's ways, but God can do anything. And our text says right here, for nothing will be impossible with God. That's a Bible verse you can memorize today. You can take with you when you leave the church service today. It's simple. Say it out loud with me. For nothing will be impossible with God. There you did it. You memorized it. And remember it. And take it with you. And when you're faced with those times that are perplexing to you, and you know that you can't understand God's thoughts, just know this. Nothing, say it again, nothing will be impossible with God. So we look at this story from the perspective of a 21st century Christian. We say, of course Mary was a woman of great faith. After all, she's mother of the Messiah. But in the moment, it was certainly daunting for her, far beyond what we can imagine. Her faith increased as she opened her heart to God. Now, I want to say to you that if your heart will open to God, you can begin to practice what I call God sightings. God sightings. And you begin to recognize him when you thought it was impossible. Now, my kids used to have a little book that uh, we would look at, and we'd have to stare at it for a long time because it was called Where's Waldo? Has anybody seen a Where's Waldo book? Raise your hand. It, you're missing something if you don't know what I'm talking about. So you see this crowd, this mass of people, and there's this one person in the crowd named Waldo. And it's a great way to take a little child and get them to sit and stare and focus at something. And you can uh, actually get something else done while they're trying to find Waldo. And there's about 10 or 12 different settings in which the child is trying to find Waldo. Now, we had a very enterprising little girl named Deanne. And I uh, found this book a few years ago. And I realized that she's taken all the mystery out of it because she took a Sharpie and she circled all the Waldos. <laughs> and actually, we kept the book because it's just so funny that she did that, you know. It's ruined. You don't have to search to find Waldo. And you want me to do that for you today. You want me as your pastor to say, will you, pastor, just circle the answer for me so that I'll know how God is working in my life but it doesn't work that way. What you need is the open 
adventurous and curious heart to say, I believe that God is making himself known to me and I will have a heart of wonder, an experience of believing that if I wait and search and focus long enough, I will have a God sighting. Some of you know that about two weeks ago, I had the, the dubious task of officiating at the funeral service for a couple who was dear friends of ours who were killed in a car crash. And, and at that funeral, I talked to them about the comfort of Jesus Christ to this grieving family. And I said, Jesus will make himself known to you. You'll, see, you'll hear him, his voice in a song. You'll, you'll hear Jesus speak to you in something that you read. You'll see Jesus in the eyes of a person who stands on your doorstep with a casserole and greets you with a hug. You'll see Jesus long after others seem to have forgotten your pain, and you'll see Jesus coming to you to minister to you. In a thousand ways, Jesus will make himself known if you'll look for him, if you'll open your hearts to him. And a lot of people here in this room today have experienced grief of your own, and some of you are grieving right now. And I want to say to you, it's true, you'll see him in a God sighting. Mary teaches us a lot about wonder, choosing wonder instead of fear. She's saying, I don't know how this is all going to turn out. I don't know if Joseph will leave me. I don't know if my family will reject me. I don't know if the religious leaders will take me to the edge of the city and stone me to death for being an adulterer. I do not know. But what she said is a response. This is the fourth great truth. Mary's response models the most life-altering prayer we can ever pray. I'm telling you this. You can never pray a prayer that's more life-altering than the prayer that Mary prayed. Look at it right here in our text in verse 38. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be to me according to your word. First she stated who she was. I'm the Lord's servant. I belong to the Lord. That's a big affirmation to the Lord. When you're in your time of fear, when you're in your time of perplexity, when you're in time of wonder, when you're in time of grief, when you're in a time of distress, when you don't know what to do or where to go or how it's going to work out, to just take that stand and say, I am the Lord's servant. Here I stand, I know that he will see me through, and so let it be to me according to your word, I trust you, God. That's a good place to be, don't you think? So today, where is it that you need to trust God? What are you facing right now that causes you more of a sense of perplexity and fear than it does a sense of wonder? Mary's obedience taught us a lot about wonder. Those of us in this room who have answered the call to pastoral ministry, we know what a sense of wonder it is, that sense of obedience. We know in many places in our lives when God has called us to say, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I trust you, God. I trust you. There are things God's been asking you to do. And you need to focus on the mystery instead of the logistics. Instead of saying, oh, I can't do it. I'm too busy. I have too many things on the plate. I, I, I have all these excuses, God. I know you understand. There used to be a plaque hanging in the church in Spokane, Washington, where I pastored. I really loved this little saying. It said, God doesn't ask about your ability. He asks about your availability. And that's what Mary answered. I am the Lord's servant. I am available to you. So what about you? Are you available to the Lord today and what he may be asking you? 
There may be somebody who you know is discouraged and they need a good word. And you're just a little bit afraid they might think you're some religious nut. And so you keep your mouth quiet and you haven't said anything. But are you willing, are you willing to speak up for Jesus? Are you willing to be available to what he might be asking you to do? I want to pray together as we close this message and open our hearts to what the Lord may be saying to us now. Lord Jesus, please forgive us for all of the times that we've been locked down in fear rather than living in wonder. Forgive us when we think so, the think so logically and fail to think theologically. Forgive us when we're not obedient, when we're self-preoccupied. We come before you now in the beginning of this Advent series, looking at the life of a young woman who literally changed history when she said yes to you. May we also be found so faithful that we will say yes. There are people who are hearing this and are in this prayer time right now who are knowing that God is speaking to their hearts right now and waiting to see if they will say yes. Help us to have the courage to say yes to God. And we pray it in Jesus' name and together we say, Amen. <laughs>